So good morning, everybody. I'm going to talk about distributed ledger technology or blockchain, which is that other B word that people just keep hearing too much about all the time. It's either Brexit or blockchain these, these days. Um, what we're going to cover is the broad landscape around the technology, uh, some insurance projects that are going on, and I know that we have a panel session afterwards where they're going to go, I would imagine, a little bit deeper around something that they're working on. I'm going to take a look at the startup community. It was really interesting, the previous panel was talking about talent. Well, a lot of the latent talent right now is actually in the startup community, and I do mentoring with uh, organisations, and it's fascinating to see the enthusiasm there. So I'm going to just totally disagree with one of the panellists before, who was saying about how the insurance sector is seen as being really boring, because when I was working in insurance, we insured nuclear power stations, oil tankers, space satellites, aeroplanes, things that when they go bang... You see them on the news straight away. That's really interesting. You know, we did catastrophe modeling of um, earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis. From a data analytics point of view, that, that's fascinating. So I actually think that the industry needs to be doing more of uh, actually showing just how attractive this market is and how actually fascinating it is. So we start off with an introduction. Um, because we work in the insurance sector, we have a little bit of small print here that anything I say is my personal view only. Um, prediction it's really easy to get wrong. Most of us get the future wrong. If we didn't get the future wrong, we wouldn't be sitting here. We'd be on a beach in Bali having retired already. Uh, and the other thing as well, because we're going to be talking a little bit about crypto and this kind of thing, don't take, take this in any way as financial, taxation, or legal advice. Is that reasonable with everybody? If you'd like some advice on those, we can speak separately. I, I do charge on that. Okay, so a quick bit of background at me. Roger was saying I've, I've worked in a number of industries over the years, uh, retail, pharmaceuticals, commodity trading. And that's where it gets really interesting straight away because my background is, is, is around data analytics and data exploitation and emerging technologies. And I found it fascinating. I actually worked in the commodities trading industry for about four or five years where we chartered oil tankers. We had about 70 VLCCs on charter at any point in time. And this was over 10 years ago. And this is where I find fascinating where everyone was talking about aggregation of risk and tracking the ships and everything. The commodities traders are doing that already. You know, I, I developed systems years ago that was looking at a vessel and knew where it was 15 minutes ago because we were tracking its fuel burn and we're looking at its profitability. So this is where I find that um, having them moved into the insurance industry, where I worked for a company that was insuring those ships, I found it fascinating just that we're a little bit behind the times and using technology. So my passion around technology is about looking what's going on in other industries and seeing how we can apply it to the insurance sector. So hopefully that'll be of, of some interest to you. Just get some buzzwords out of the way. Uh, blockchain. It's just a protocol to describe how data is stored. Distributed ledger, it's how it's shared. People mix up the phrases. You'll hear them used synonymously. Just quick check, has anyone got a hoover here? Show of hands, who's got a hoover? Okay, is it actually a hoover or is it a Dyson? Okay, and is that actually a vacuum cleaner? Okay, because a Dyson isn't a vacuum cleaner and it's not a Hoover, but we all use those terms interchangeably. And you know what? It doesn't really matter because we use all of them for gathering dust. So it's the same with blockchain and DLT. You'll hear the terms used interchangeably. Don't worry about it. Smart contract, it's just something that executes. It's a thing that in the old days we used to call a computer program. So some of the people who are involved in cyber liability and that may have heard of that. Um, and oracles is something that you'll, you'll hear this term used these days. It basically means a trusted data source. Let's keep it simple for this. Blockchain, DLT, it's a write-only database that everyone's got an identical copy of. And that just means that it's immutable, it's not changeable, and that means you can use it as a trusted data source. A few myths to bust. Um, people sometimes hear about Bitcoin. Does anyone own Bitcoin here? Yeah, a few hands going up and a few hands being kept down after the way it went down in price. Bitcoin's an example of a blockchain, but there are many blockchains. Bitcoin isn't the only one. And they are actually very secure. It was interesting hearing about the cyber risk element before. Blockchains are very invulnerable to cyber attack because of the way that they're designed. Uh, they, they reduce the risk. And in fact, I ran an event uh, in Lloyd's library a few months ago 
about actually using blockchain to make things more cyber secure, which is an interesting one. Um, cryptocurrency is not the only use, and it's not all about illicit trading. If you read the press reports, you think that cryptocurrencies and blockchain are just used for drug running and money laundering and that kind of thing. Um, I can assure you, and this isn't from her first-hand evidence, but anecdotal evidence, uh, the most uh, used currency at the moment for illicit trading still remains the US dollar, but by a mile. Um, blockchains are not going to consume all the energy of the world, you hear this. It's not the answer to anything, so as a blockchain evangelist, 95% uh, of the projects I look at are not actually suitable for blockchainizing in any way. Um, but the fascinating thing is, it is an immature technology. I describe it a little bit like aviation in 1903 right now. We're kind of sitting on that beach with the Wright brothers in a single-seater aeroplane, and already there are people who are saying, let's stick 400 people on it and see if we can make it go 500 miles an hour. For those of you who've been involved in aviation in any way, you'll understand that in order to go from single-seat aeroplanes to a 400-seater, you have this thing called crashing, you know, and accidents and tragedy and litigation and lessons learned. And it takes a while to get from one to the other. That's the same with this technology. But to close on that, it really could cure world hunger. One of the projects that's uh, using blockchain is about actually tracking and tracing uh, charity donations. I don't know if you're aware, there's something like $150 billion worth of donations go to charity each year, of which about $50 billion disappears. We don't know where it goes. It could be theft, it could be fraud, it could be poor accounting. So imagine we can use a technology that actually recovers $50 billion a year and give, gives it to the third world. So I, I think it really could cure world hunger. A little bit about the blockchain landscape. It, it was interesting reading um, Reuters this morning. There's announcements about how uh, a number of blockchains are beginning to fail right now. And Gartner, who are an IT technology company, that they describe new technology adoption as going through these phases of an innovation trigger, so it's a new idea. Then you get what they call the peak of inflated expectations, which is where you get all the hype and all the marketing people getting excited about it. Then when it comes down to the reality, you've got this trough of disillusionment. The, the market for blockchain seems to be heading in that direction a little bit at the moment, that there are a number of projects that actually, when you try and turn to them into production systems, they're not actually working out as well as expected. But it's, it'll be nice to hear the views of the panel in the next group, because I think they've got one of the few examples of something that's actually working. So blockchain, th th there's more to come, definitely. The lessons for the insurance sector to begin with is that the rest of financial services are putting a lot of money into this area. Okay, they're looking at AI, they're looking at IoT, but we've spent something like, I think it's about $2 billion in the last 18 months on blockchain related projects. And we take a look at patents. I guess we don't have any patent infringement people here this morning, but there's a lot of patents being taken out in this technology. The really fascinating thing is that a lot of the major patent holders are the banks who are saying on the record that blockchain is a really bad idea. So that's kind of interesting that they're slating it in one direction whilst taking out the patents in it in another direction. So that they're clearly protecting themselves. And I have a note in the corner as well. China filed 225 patents last year in blockchain. So as well as them saying that they want to be a world leader in artificial intelligence by 2025, they're clearly trying to dominate this sector as well. Let's take a look at a few use cases. I've got it broken down into four areas. And this is where I'm seeing blockchains beginning to be used already. So the first is as a ledger, which is where you can do tracking and tracing. So supply chain is the classic one on that. And I know that Maersk have been involved in several projects around doing that and using IoT devices to track cargoes and ships load it onto a blockchain and that. But there are other examples. Everledger is a great example where they're putting diamonds on the blockchain and they're able to track and trace them. I, I hadn't realized that diamond has something like 24 unique features, which is kind of like its own signature. Be, being a man, I thought the only feature that a diamond had was its price and, and everything else was kind of irrelevant. But apparently it has lots of features and they record that and they can track the diamond through its life from it being extracted from the mine from its first polish in India to its second polishing in Rotterdam to its final sale in Covent Market in London, and then the onward sale. There's already the, that being used for fraud detection because it means that if someone reports that their diamonds have been stolen, 
then you can actually track it um, on the ledger. And there have been examples already of stolen diamonds being reported and then appearing on eBay, which is a really interesting thing. Um, cryptocurrencies, we're not really going to go into that. Bitcoin is the big one. You all have heard about that. that that's the one that everyone talks about because it's been going up, down, all over the place. Um, identity management, I know there are people from Guard Time here today. They'd be better suited to talk about what's going on in Estonia. But Estonia is fascinating. Um, for those who understand the geography of Estonia, you'll appreciate that they've got a neighbour that has a lot of tanks and a lot of interest in expanding its area. And so Estonia's developed an identity management capability using blockchain. That means that they can keep track of the citizens' assets and actually run a government service on it as well. The awesome thing about Estonia is that it's only, I think the population is less than 3 million people. So you can actually stick that on an Excel spreadsheet. So it's not a big thing. So what they've actually done is they've rolled out the Estonian registry system as an identity management scheme into which we can all plug into if we want to set companies up in Estonia. So if you want to trade across the EU, but I'm seeing that with a number of small companies that are moving into that space and they're creating Estonian identity registrations. So kind of like an electronic passport. So that's quite an interesting one. Um, in the public service, and this is the thing about blockchain, it's being... Um, introduced in public sector, private sector, third sector, it's being introduced in everything. UK Benefits Agency was interesting, they did a project in 2016 around actually using blockchain and smart contracts to issue benefits payments. So if you've been issued with some money for, say, housing accommodation, it was to make sure that you only spent it on housing and not on special brew. Um, and it was really interesting because the people who are taxpayers tend to say, oh, that's a great idea, you've got better control of um, benefits money going out. And people who are more libertarian said, that's a disgrace, you're tracking how people spend their money. So that project was actually delayed a little bit because it creates a lot of uh, political challenges, shall we say. And then there's the final area of programmability. There are more and more examples coming up of people actually using the programmable features in blockchains to develop new solutions. Uh, consortia is, is a big growth. We, we take a look at insurance. There are several blockchain consortia around the world. So uh, some of you may be familiar with B3i, which started off with, I think it was five major reinsurance companies, grew to 18 and then 30-something, I think it was, for their final testing. So they're actually developing a solution around the retrocession phase of insurance, I think, um, about developing the whole reinsurance piece. So they're one to watch for. Riskblock Alliance out in the States, they're doing some major things. And R3, which is originally a US company that's now based in London, are doing a lot of interesting things around insurance as well uh, and working with a number of companies on that. There's a whole range of other ones. What I tend to find is that you can only have so much fun with the blockchain on your own. It's not the kind of thing you implement in your own company. It's something you do across a complete supply chain. And so that's why the idea of consortia working together uh, seem, seems to be effective on this. A few insurance projects. Well, actually, there's quite a few insurance projects. Now, we, we look at the whole policy admin side of things. Um, Blockshore is a London-based startup. I'm an advisor to them. Hence the asterisk. And they're doing a number of initiatives around policy administration and control. Um, we've got a whole range of companies from the startup space right the way through to like Zongam, Pingam. Um, so a lot of the major Chinese companies are, are doing things on that. Um, IoT is certainly linking in on this. Things like flight delay insurance. I'm helping um, a company who are doing some stuff around flight delay. They're going through the FCA Innovation Sandbox right now. So that's um, where actually the regulators are very interested in this space. Uh, and they're actually supporting and encouraging it. So I'm helping a company on that. And down at the bottom there, you'll see marine. Yeah, there are projects going on in the marine sector as well. Um, and again, Mer Merck are involved with that, um, and Microsoft and R3. So there's a whole range of areas going on with that. Um, in the London market itself, I used to be involved in the London market, the, the blockchain projects. They're now running some, funnily enough, claims mentioned earlier on as being an area for using blockchain. Well, there is a project going on on the target operating model project at the moment, which is the part of London modernization, which is about looking at putting claims onto a blockchain. So, you know, some people are thinking ahead on that. Very quickly, startups, there's loads of them. There's about 1,800 working in 
the, the blockchain space at the moment, around about a third of which are in finance and insurance. There's a whole ecosystem developing. That there's lots and lots of them. And there's a thing called initial coin offerings, which is fascinating because it's a new way of raising funding whereby a, um, a startup goes off and basically sells some tokens. So they're a little bit like fairground ride tokens. Um, and they raise lots of money from them. And we can have a conversation separately outside if anyone wants to catch up on that. I actually run a group around that where we have 1,000 members in London looking about this because it is a novel form of fundraising because it doesn't count as debt or equity. And that means it's very, very interesting to startups because they're not having to give away part of their company and they're not hitting their balance sheet with a load of debt. The reason I mention ICOs or initial coin offerings is because it means that there's a lot of new companies that didn't exist yesterday that exist today. Um, so if we skip to the kind of money that this is raising. Last year, there's around about $4 billion raised in ICOs, so not an insubstantial amount. So far this year, there's been over $11 billion raised. So this is new companies, new projects that may not have existed three months ago that have now got, you know, some examples, they've raised $200 million in hours. Now, I don't know how easy your access to capital is these days, but being able to spin up a startup and giving it $200 million in a matter of hours means that there's a lot of stuff going on in this space. But ultimately, it's, it's the so what. So what I'm seeing with, with blockchain DLT, um, companies are looking at cost reduction, they're looking at improving transparency, they're looking at improving the supply chain. But that does involve them changing their business processes as well. And this is where some of the banks, I think the announcements um, about DCCC, which is one of the US um, trading bodies, that they've kind of delayed their blockchain implementation, is because they're actually finding it harder than expected to deploy into real world systems, where they've got legacy applications that they need to upgrade. They've got chief information officers who've said, hang on, I've just spent $10 million on my new policy admin system or whatever, and now you're saying rip it out and put blockchain in place. That's just not going to happen. Cryptocurrencies, definitely an interesting area. Um, if you think you don't really understand cyber risk and cyber liability, believe me, cryptocurrencies is that, again, it's even bigger. And you look at it at the moment, the total market cryptocurrencies is around about $250 billion, and it's not particularly well insured. So I'll leave that to sink in, because I'm mentioning this to all the insurers that I meet about, are you doing cryptocurrency? Are you insuring it? Uh, there are lots of opportunities there, definitely. And ICOs, it's a new way of funding, so watch out, because uh, you may be watching your competitor landscape about what's going on, and then a new company will pop into being overnight, uh, and it'll just come kind of left field. So with that, I think we just have a few minutes for questions, if anyone has any questions. Or have I scourged you all enough? Yeah. Who, as in underwriters? Um, there are a couple of brokers who are looking at it. It tends to be the smaller brokers. Sorry, the question is who is actually um, insuring cryptocurrency? There, there aren't that many examples at the moment. If anyone goes back to base after today or after the cocktail reception, staggers back into the office in the morning uh, and speaks to their colleagues and finds anyone who is doing uh, crypto insurance, please contact me because I'm working with a number of companies and I have a meeting with uh, a broking firm later later next week, who've actually established a cryptocurrency insurance community where we're looking at this. Any other questions? So, shout. Okay. So, the London market itself, many, many different people involved, lots of green key, it would appear at face value the blockchain is an answer, and I think in a sure way, I've seen that in Marine, I'm just wondering why that could be expanded to the market as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. It was interesting. I spent some time on the underwriting floor at Lloyd's, uh, just watching the activity that goes on there, and how you see brokers walking all over the place, and how you see the underwriters sitting there, and how you see the chairs at slightly different heights, which I always explain to the startups why that is, and they burst out laughing, and, and then we have to take them off the underwriting floor. But when you look at the nature of that, the market, uh, that's a physical manifestation of peer-to-peer -peer activity. There's no intermediary. The broker is going directly to each of the underwriters. They're not going via anybody. 
And this is where sometimes people think of the London market or the Lloyds market as being like a centralised system. It's actually the original peer-to-peer marketplace. It was developed 350 years ago, and the business model is absolutely rock solid. When I then overlaid how blockchain technology works, which is peer-to-peer, it's one of those very few occasions where you overlay the technology against the business process, and you go, they're kind of the same. So it's absolutely a natural candidate. And that's why when I had the chance to move into other industries and start deploying blockchain, I thought, no, this is the industry to be in, because this is the one where it'll make the biggest difference quickest. So? Uh, you know, but I really read. Just a question about understanding up to now from the blockchain technology we have been in this relatively slow building up this digital <coughs> network, having a multiple number of computers in the system, means relatively small, high energy is consuming, and basically very expensive. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, so the, the speed of adoption has got nothing to do with the protocol or the technology. That's to do with organisation inertia. That, that, that's just a, a company type thing. In terms of the energy consumption, you may remember one of my earth, earlier Mythbusters was that it doesn't consume all the energy in the world. At the moment, the technology is inefficient. If you think about the first um, petrol engines for cars, I don't know what their fuel economy was, but I suspect it's not very good. And it took a number of years before we get to nowadays where what, a, a, an auto diesel engine is, what, 80 miles to the gallon or something. So it, it does take time to become more efficient. And with this technology, I'll be the first to admit, it's not efficient in its energy use yet, but that will just take a couple of years. And, and bear in mind in this industry as well, when you talk to people, uh, I was speaking to someone the other week and they were talking about their long-term vision. I said, can we just check, what, what do you mean by long-term? He said, oh, two years. You know, so the, the, the pace at which this stuff's moving is pretty good. Yeah. Okay, I'm being asked to close it off from that, so thank you for your time and your attention.